Hey, John Tsai here, and welcome to the Self-Publishing Summit. Our guest today is going to be talking about how to hook an agent in seven days. She's worked with novelists and non-fiction authors for over 20 years and is the founder and CEO of the Oxford Literary Consultancy. Her clients include millionaire authors, best-selling writers and celebrities, as well as complete beginners. And she's the author of several books, including Celebrity Author Secrets and How to Sell One Million Books. Our guest today is Stephanie Hill. Stephanie, welcome to the Self-Publishing Summit. Hi, John. Thanks for inviting me. Great to have you on. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming in. We were just chatting before we, we came on air how Stephanie lives just up the road from me in Oxford, just up the road from me in Oxford, which is nice. Nice to have somebody local. And uh, so I've given that quick intro, Stephanie, but tell us a bit more about what it is you do and the sort of authors you work with before we then go across and get into the, the meat of this, which is going to be how to hook an agent in seven days. Oh, goodness. I mean, I work with authors um, at Oxford Literary Consultancy with on all stages of their work, mm. mentoring them while they're actually writing their books. Um, we help them to publish their books, to self-publish their books. We help them to pitch their books to literary agents. Um, and we help them with the marketing and the PR of the books. I mean, that's a speciality of mine because my background is as a journalist and newsreader. So I've got right. very good contacts in the media um, and help basically unknown authors become best-selling authors and go from zero into very well-known sort of celebrity authors, if you like. So um, we help property authors, we help entrepreneurs, we have a lot of speeches, a lot of coaches. We also help a lot of fiction authors mm. um, um, with all aspects of their writing and their campaigns. So both, and um, we're slightly different to a lot of publishers in that we are both, we help with both self-publishing and with traditional mainstream publishing. I mean, that's where yeah. the... Um, consultancy first started was with a lot of traditional publishers and literary agents and we still do a lot of editing proofreading for mainstream publishers too great i mean perfect perfect for this uh, the self publishing summit and uh, great that you've got that overlap between the self publishing the tradition and you fiction and non fiction which is great so um i i'm looking forward to this presentation because you know we haven't discussed before now what you're going to talk about so why don't you why didn't you kick things off uh, how do we hook an agent in seven days well one of the things i've noticed over the years i mean i've worked at oxford university as assistant director of creative writing i worked for the arts council running literary events in the past and then i moved into my own business and one of the things i really noticed over the years was that there were some really really talented authors who were kind of falling by the wayside and had written a lot of books that have won awards i've you know mm -hmm. i've won awards for my own books um, but they weren't actually making a lot of money. So I've got Booker prize winning authors on my list of clients. I've got very well known best selling authors on my list who are household names, who people would be very surprised if they actually knew how much they were really earning. Equally, I have millionaire authors on my list who are selling little ebooks where you sometimes think, oh my goodness, um, that's not quite as good a quality as perhaps you might hope for. Um, and they're making a lot of money from them. And so I suppose. What I see as my role is kind of acting as a bridge between the two camps from the, mm. the people who are very good at marketing and they understand marketing and they're making a lot of money. And then the traditional authors, as I, as I see them, a lot of them who are not making as much money. You, I mean, you really would be surprised by some of my clients. Obviously, I can't mm. name names, but mm -hmm. some of them are selling literally hundreds of millions of books. Yeah. And they are not as rich as people imagine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, some of them who have Hollywood film deals, and again, they are not as rich as people imagine. So we really, we act as a bridge between the two worlds. We try and teach the traditional writers, the ones with traditional publishing, to be better marketers and understand the process of marketing. And then the other people who are making a lot of money, they want to pitch to agents. So, but with both of them, always it comes down to p pitching yourself and being a good marketer, which of mm. course authors surprisingly actually it's one of the things that i'd i'd say probably 95 percent of authors really struggle with when i see their pitches to agents they're pretty bad um, <laughs> they're good at blowing their trumpet in their books but when it comes to actually doing the pitch they're not very good at it um and so yeah i mean i have a very good record with getting uh agents um usually people come back to me within 24 hours often what i hear is people um uh, pitching their books and they can wait six months for a reply and then usually it's a rejection um, yeah. it's it's really about thinking what is it the publisher wants out of this what is it the agent wants out of this 
and how mm. can I frame my work that makes it sound as, as attractive as possible? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I really take your point that a lot of authors are not good marketers. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Robert Kiyosaki, it's not a quote as much, but it was something he talked about in one of his books when he talks about he's, he's a best-selling author, not a best writing author. And I think it's it's certainly a mindset shift that a lot of authors have to make, both traditionally and self-published authors, which is to to get into the marketing thing. Because unfortunately, it's not the case that a great book will necessarily sell itself. Um, you know, people do judge books by their covers and uh, the titles do make a difference and all of those things. And so there's a lot that goes into the process. And I, I, one of the things I, I was trying to communicate to people is that, you know, you've really got to get into uh, some of the marketing side as well to maximize your chances of success but at the same time you also want to write a good book as well yeah you can um you know you can have short-term success but it's not going to last if you haven't got a good book to back that up and, and good quality content yeah i mean often you get the, the marketing spike um the exactly, sales yeah. spike on amazon where they or, or for the new york times bestseller list yeah like for a couple of weeks and then it shoots right back down um, but of course, they've accomplished what they set out to achieve. <laughs> it, work, it works in that sense. But yeah, if you want to have long term success, you have to have a bit more of a strategy. As with all these things, you have a strategy. And one of the mm. things I will say to my clients is, what do you want to achieve long term? You know, because there's a different strategy for everything. Is it that yeah. they want to um, get in airports? Is it that they want to have a film deal? Is it that they want to win awards? Is it that they want bestseller status? Do they want to make lots of money? Each one of those things has a slightly different strategy. They're not all the same. Um, and so you can frame things very differently. I mean, for example, you might have a book that you want to have a really big media appeal with it. So you want lots of media publicity and to get in the Times or you want to get in the Huffington Post or whatever. Again, that's a different strategy to winning a literary award, a very different strategy actually, to winning a literary award. Um, so, as you yeah. mentioned before, it's not always the best books that actually go up the bestseller lists. Um, yeah. And it's, I, just on that point, uh, you know, talking about different strategies depending on your outcomes, does that um, do, does choosing that strategy based on that outcome, does that also affect the, the way that you pitch to agents? It varies from book to book. It depends whether the media that you're pitching to um, has the same um, target readership as your literary. Mm. Um, I mean, for example, to give you an example of a nice example, um, my daughters um, who are aged eight and nine have written books recently. So I've been pitching their books to literary agents. We've had six literary agents at the moment who are all competing to represent them. Um, and um, I will use the same pitch to the media because it's based on the fact that they were both traumatized by an accident and the books were part of their recovery. The ceiling cave, caved in on them. Um, mm. and they were both injured in that and they were both very, they were both quite traumatized by that happening. So that was kind of newsworthy. And although it's not about the book, this is what authors a lot of the time don't get is that mm. the pitch is as much about you and your story and just human emotion. It's not always about the book. Um, particularly when you're pitching the media and you're in the run-up to your book mm. launch, but equally with agents, they buy the story, they buy the person, they're not always buying the book. And often, I mean, I've, I've worked mm. on um, library book selection committees in the past when I was working for the, Art, uh, sorry, the Arts Council, um, and they very, very often, and this is in public libraries, they, they don't look at the book at all, they'll look at the cover. <laughs> And they make they make an assumption based on that. And this is why a lot of midlist authors at the moment are struggling because if you're a midlist author and you haven't had many books either borrowed at libraries or sold in bookshops, they won't buy you. They just mm. won't buy you. If you're a new author, this can actually work hugely to your advantage um, because you've got no track record. They can't look at your ISBN and Nielsen's your book scan records and see how many copies you've sold or had borrowed. Um, so it, it's an exciting time for new writers without a doubt, but you have to learn about marketing, which is why what you're doing is so great. Thank you. And I mean, I think that's a great point and uh, very interesting, as you say, that it can actually work, this sort of thing can actually work to the advantage uh, of new authors. And of course, you know, there are a lot of people now coming into the, the space, either to self-publish or to, you know, people are going to mid-tier publishing or partnership publishing, and some people are still, you know, going after the um, in the traditional publishing deals and you know we talked uh, before we came on air about how you know some people use self-publishing as a stepping stone and be building the platform that sort of thing whilst they're self-publishing but hoping to get an agent and um, 
and I can't remember, I mentioned it's great to have you on here talking about this because I, we haven't had anybody else on the summit talking about the process of actually how to get an agent. So, um, you know, what's what's the next? I mean, obviously, the marketing, you know, we've established it. It's very key. And, and um, there's marketing both in terms of marketing the book, marketing to the prospective agent, the actual pitch, and also marketing to the media as well. So we're covering there's, there's different things going on here. Um, you know, what's what's the next thing that people need to be thinking about? Well, if you're approaching literary agents, um, the key things are thinking like a literary agent. And a literary agent is going to take 10% for your home, home rights. They're going to take 20% for your foreign rights. And obviously there's film rights as well. So um, although the majority of books these days are getting around £5,000 was the first advance, plus, say, 10% royalties, um, if you think that most literary agents are only going to be taking 10% of that, that that's £500. Yeah. <laughs> <Unless> it's, <laughs> it's not a huge yeah. incentive, is it? Exactly. How much effort are you going to make for £500? So they've got to have a pretty good reason. Either they've got to think the book is very marketable um, and they're going to make lots of money from it, um, or they're going to pitch to maybe six publishers and then they're going to give up and say, this book is not publishable. Of course, there's hundreds of publishers. So when they've tried, say, six to 12 publishers and they've all said no, it doesn't mean the new book isn't publishable. It just means those the six or 12 publishers they've approached um, uh, have not agreed to it. They haven't said mm. that they'll, uh, they'll take it on. Um, so you can keep going. It's not, to me, it's not a sign that a book is not publishable. I don't agree with that at all. Um, yeah. but in well, you've got of lots of classic examples, haven't <laughs> we? Sorry to interrupt you, Stephanie, but you've got classic examples of people that have been rejected dozens or even hundreds of times before they've succeeded you know uh, Frederick Forsyth John Grisham um, Jack Canfield people like that yeah yeah absolutely um, but I mean this I'd say there's three parts to the pitch now writers often again don't get this the first part which is actually the most important part which is often often actually the neglected part is your mm. covering letter because if you think what happens when um, an agent gets your work um, they read the covering letter, then they'll look at the synopsis, and then, if they're intrigued enough, they will look at your first chapter. Then they'll ask yeah. the manuscript. Now, if your covering letter goes on about, um, I mean, God, I've seen some incredible ones over the years. That I bet tell you've seen all sorts, personal yeah. Biography about their wife, about, you know, guilt tripping them, about, you know, they're ill and this is their last hope, and they're broke and they've lost their job and you just think what are you doing <laughs> um really they, all the all the agent wants to know is they can sell the book they want to know there's a target readership that will buy it it's in a genre it's it's a topical thing also increasingly they want to know what's your social media platform how many people have you got following you on things like Facebook or on YouTube or on LinkedIn. Not many people want to hear this, but of course, if you're um, an entrepreneur or somebody with your own business, you've probably already got that. This is where perhaps novelists find it a lot harder to get on board mm. because they do want you. I mean, people think when they get a publisher, suddenly they've got this big marketing machine behind their book and it's they're going to be famous and it's going to be easy, but it doesn't, it really isn't like that. You know, what mm. you benefit from being with a big publisher is that. They're a big distributor. They've got global distribution, and you're also you're in the same stable as other other well-known authors. So you're kind of piggybacking on their brand, if you like, and that's a huge benefit, of course. Mm. Um, but you're still expected to do all the marketing. You're still expected <laughs> to do the PR, and often I've seen um, people's marketing plan, what is called a marketing plan by their publisher, by some names mm. that would surprise you. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's the same marketing plan that they give to everybody, but just with a different book title. Um, yeah. Uh, but of course, they think no, nobody else will see that they're all the same marketing plan with the same template. Um, mm. So you're still going to do all the marketing. But going back to what you originally asked, so your, your covering letter, which has to yeah. be a strong one sentence pitch or hook for your book, um, a little bit about you that gives credibility for you. Um, and short and sweet. Some people write three pages. They seem to work on the assumption that if I just write it and get it down, they'll, they'll want me. Um, and they just put as much as they possibly can. But actually, the shorter and sweeter, the better. If you think that some of these publishers are getting a 1,000 manuscripts a week, a 1,000 yeah. manuscripts a week, what they want is something they can glance at. And in one glance, they just know. If they think they're going to read through three pages of reams, you know, reams and reams of paper, and then they've got mm. this long synopsis that's another three pages, and then all this 
the whole manuscript, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's just yeah. so not going to happen. Um, so as I say, normally what I do is I, I will send, um, and the other thing also actually that helps is if you've got testimonials or endorsements mm. or somebody who's done a manuscript assessment or a critique of your work and given you positive feedback. Yeah. Um, things that let them know that you understand marketing, um, you know, yeah. maybe you've been in the media before, maybe you have a, um, as I say, a strong platform on social media, maybe you have a strong track record um, as writing as a columnist for um, mm. newspapers. And this is what I train a lot of authors in is how to go from nothing to appearing in the media. Yeah. People think that you need to have a book with a kind of um, somebody else's logo, like a penguin logo on your spine in order to get big coverage on the BBC television or in the Times. You do not, absolutely do not have to. These days, self-publishing is so professional, or it can be, I should say, some people are very, very professional with it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some people are not so professional with it. Um, but the it's professional... a bit like covering letters, isn't it, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the more professional <laughs> ones are just as good. I mean, you look at the cover and no one can tell who's published it because it's just, that you know, they're, they're professional. And so journalists are quite happy, more than happy, to talk to you and to give you media coverage. Um, so, yeah, I think that answers your question. I kind of rambled a bit. No, no, I think that's fantastic. Um, and just as you can probably see, I've been putting lots of notes down while, while you've been talking while I'm off, off camera. And uh, it's it's fascinating stuff. And what's interesting is is everything you've said about the the things that go into a good covering letter and the structure and the fact that it needs to be short and sweet and get straight to the point and all that. And, and people are very busy, which you can see. It's all it's in a se in a way it's sort of common sense. But you know you, we all know the saying common sense isn't that common. And I'm sure you know as you say you've seen all sorts of different kinds of covering letters and ones that are pages long. Um, so great to actually get those those. The really useful points that if you follow those, it'll, that in itself is going to make a huge difference. So you said that there were three parts of the pitch and that that was the first, which was the covering letter. So, you know, what, what uh, should we go to step two or part two now? Oh, yeah, the synopsis. Actually, as you were talking, it just reminded me, I've got a client at the moment who is, um, she was a leading researcher in um, cancer. Um, and she um, then ended up developing breast cancer. So she'd written mm. Really quite interesting, well, I think it's fascinating memoir about her time as a doctor and a surgeon um, working in hospitals. Now, the book is fascinating, but when she wrote the pitch mm. for me, she came to me with her pitch. Um, I won't name names, um, but it started out telling, you know, it started out from the point of view of a memoir um, of somebody who'd grown up in Petticoat Lane in London and then mm. started working in a hospital and then eventually worked in other places. Now, unless you're famous, a memoir is not going to be that interesting. You know, they're not yeah. really, it's not a popular form. But if you frame it as, imagine how you'd feel carrying out an autopsy on a three-year-old child when your own child is tucked up in bed at home. Imagine mm. how you feel researching cancer cells under a microscope when you yourself discover that you have breast cancer. Suddenly, it becomes an interesting book. So that's just, it's the same book, but it's a slightly different hook and thinking, yeah. What is it the reader wants? Because that's what the agent wants. So that's just to give you an example of what you might do, both with the synopsis um, mm. and with the covering letter. Um, is you you think I'm the reader? What is it I as the reader most wants to read? Whether it's um, with fiction, they want the page turning quality. They want an exciting story. Um, they don't want to be bogged down by detail, but mm. something that's quite compelling, a compelling hook. They don't want every single detail of the plot and Often people think with a synopsis, what they mean by a synopsis is to put everything into this. It's mm. only a one page. I I always say um, that you think of the blurb on the book jacket. It's something that intrigues and entices you to read on. Um, and it gives it gives them a reason to say, gosh, I want to find out what happens next. Um, if it's a non-fiction book, generally speaking, you're solving somebody's pain or problem um, mm -hmm. and helping them to achieve their goals or their dreams. So... If, if you just bullet point what are the things people gain from reading your book, that will go a long way to helping you structure what your book's about. But I think you need a very clear idea of who your target audience is. And as I say, mm. what you want to achieve with your book. And also the reader needs to, to know, you know, sorry, the reader, the agent needs to know who the target audience is. And with some yeah. books, it can vary. I mean, I've got a book at the moment on um, with an author who's written a book about... Um, 
uh, kind of goddesses and hypnotherapy. Now that would fit in some ways into new age um, and spiritual genres. New age and spiritual are actually separate um, for literary agents and publishers, um, but also into psychology because she's actually a trained psychologist and hypnotherapist. In fact, mm. in some ways, I think it would fit e more easily into spiritual or new age. But of course, she'd like to see it in psychotherapy. Um, or of course, the self-help would be another genre, but it's, it helps to tell the agent what the genre is because otherwise you could end up having your book pitched to somebody you actually don't want want it pitched to um, yeah. and marketed in a way perhaps you don't want it to be marketed. Um, so that helps as well. Yeah. And just on that point, where, you know, taking that example where it could fit into multiple uh, genres <laughs> or categories, is that an advantage? I mean, I, I know you want to be clear on perhaps who your, your primary is, but is there an advantage to be able to market to different segments, do you think, from the point of view of pitching it to an agent or publisher? It depends what you want to achieve with your book. If you mm. want to use it as a lead generator for your business, then I think you need to be clear. I mean, you can have everyone read your book. Um, you can have, <laughs> um, for example, I say with people who are therapists or um, say property, like I get a lot of property investors work with me. Um, but I will say, well, yes, you can have everyone read your book, but do you, can they afford your services at the back end of your book? And if they can't, do you really want them as your readers or do you want to be spending your time fielding thousands of emails from people who just want advice and help? Um, mm. if, you, if, you, if you do want those people contacting you, then you want to have a series of videos to help them so that you've got somewhere to send them. Otherwise, you're going to be spending a lot of time and energy um, yeah. with people that aren't necessarily going to come to you for your services. That's assuming that's, that they want the book to act as a lead generator for the business. Um, if it's a novel, then yes, of course, it helps you to be able to fit lots of different genres. But I think people like to know, oh, that's the writer who writes horror or, oh, that's yeah. the writer who writes crime. Where you start saying crime, horror or crime romance or horror, horror, horror romance. <laughs> <I've seen laughs> it's a bit confusing. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, well, that's, a, that's a good point, isn't it? You know, you need people, if people are going to recommend you, it's the, the more, the, the easier it is for them to describe what it is you do, the easier it is for them to recommend you, and that, which is true of, of business as well as books. Yeah, definitely. Good, good. so synopsis then, so it should be a, a page, you and um, so sort of be thinking about the sort of book jacket blurb. Yeah one page kind of thing. not more than uh i'd say double spaced i mean when i say one page okay. it's amazing what people will do they will write in 10 point fonts <laughs> put single line spacing anything to cram as much onto that page as possible now uh years and years ago i mean i'm talking about 20 years ago um i had a friend whose book was sold on the basis of a one-line pitch and i always say that if you can sell a book on the basis of a one-line pitch the same way as a movie poster well, there's sometimes mm. three words. There's sometimes no more than five words. That has got to sell the book. If you've got to write reams and reams, that book ain't going to sell. <laughs> if, if <laughs> That's a great to, point. Yeah, absolutely. If you come to more than two sentences if you, to sell a book, that, that, that's not a book that's going to sell. It's, it's got to grab people's imagination in two sen sentences maximum. So keep it short and sweet. Okay, so that's a really important thing. Is it's not only is it one page or less, but that needs to be double spaced as well. So that's something you know. So you really you have, you've not got a lot of words to to describe that, have you? So you hook, you're hooking them in with a covering letter to start with a you know a really strong one sentence hook you mentioned, and then the the synopsis obviously takes them to that next level. Anything else we need to to cover on the synopsis? Um, well, I mean the. the I suppose with the synopsis, again, it goes if it feeds into the actual next stage, which is the opening chapter. Um, mm. Your opening page is actually the most important page of the book you're going to read. Um, if you think about how people buy books, um, usually what they do is they look at the front cover. They they look at the you know if it's thumbnail size on Amazon, increasingly mm. that's what they're doing. They go on the title, they look at the blurb, and then they look inside the book either at the contents, which again people don't spend enough time on their contents and on their chapter headings. That's mm. valuable real estate in yeah. marketing terms for selling mm. your books. Um, people have to think about what their chapter headings are um, and what their first, what's the first sentence? Because think about how in the old, back in the old days where people would go into bookshops, um, you'd pick up a book and you'd read the first sentence. If you didn't find that first mm. sentence gripping, you wouldn't read to the second sentence. If you like yeah. that, you'd read to the third sentence. If at any point in that process, any point, 
it doesn't grab you, you can put that book back because it just hasn't grabbed you. No one's going to find out how brilliant your chapter two is or your chapter three is or that amazing thing that happens because occasionally I'll get people who say to me, oh, it's a bit slow to, to get going, but you know, you wait till you get to chapter three and then it's a really, <laughs> oh, well, that should be your chapter one then. Yeah. <laughs> What's your yeah. open page? That's what you've got to do. You've got to give people a really good reason to keep, to keep reading. Um, yeah. Actually, but some books still, you know, think about Captain Corelli. I don't know if you read Captain Corelli's Mantle. I have, yeah. But yeah. that's very slow to get going, you know, and it's only mm. the publicity from that that makes you read the book. Mm. I think we're all victims in a way of doing O-level English or GCSE English at school, mm -hmm. where we read these things from back in the 19th century, where people would, they would wait like three chapters before anything happened. They prepared to, you know, with Hardy or all the traditional writers they would wait for something to happen because they were a lot more patient then but of course mm -hmm. nowadays with the internet people they're not prepared to wait for things they want something exciting on every page and they want cliffhangers at the end of each chapter and they want a reason to carry on reading so yeah you really really grab people on your opening page and i'd say yeah. and also have little mini cliff cliffhangers at the end of every chapter yeah so, I mean, again, really important stuff. And, really, you know, you're, what you're describing there is a sort of linear process that people mm -hmm. go through. And whether they are your prospective book buyer or whether it's the agent making a decision on whether to take you on and, and start uh, putting, uh, pushing your book out to a publisher. And uh, as you say, you know, the, the title, the hook, the first line, the co all the things that people are likely to look at before making a buying decision or a representing decision in the case of an agent, uh, they've all got to be really tight. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, you know, I mean, I can think of two authors in the last few years who've come to me with what they think of as failed novels, one of whom had gone to literally every every agent in the writer's handbook, every mm. single agent, and they'd all rejected her book. Um, and it was a fun, it's actually a fantastic novel. It's a novel called Pomegranate Sky by Louise Soraya Black. Um, so we redid the pitch, we redid the opening chapter, and then she, we got her a liter leading literary agent. She was published by Aurora Metro Press, and then she won the Virginia Prize for the book. <laughs> um, I mean, there's another one called Eamon Dean, who um, again came to me with what he thought was a failed novel. He said it's a failed novel. No one wants it. He actually had a literary agent who didn't want to place it. Um, I got him a different literary agent, um, and we also got him um, a Hollywood director who was interested in buying the. Um, the rights, the film rights for the book. He didn't decide to go with that because the book was about a terrorist and they didn't really like the ending. They wanted the ending to be a bit more upbeat <laughs> than it was. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the book. He actually self-published in the end because he chose not to go there. And this again is something that authors all need to think about is whether they actually do want to go with a mainstream publisher or whether they would rather self-publish because mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, there's a big difference and their advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, so I don't know if we've got uh, time to touch on that. So uh, first chapter, it's got to be a great first chapter. Yeah, again, get people hooked straight away. Really good uh, first line, really good second line and so on. Um, do we have time to perhaps touch on the pros and cons of traditional publishing versus self-publishing? Because I think that's, it's quite an important topic or yeah. quite an important decision that people have to make. It's yeah, it is a big decision and it, it varies with different authors. It varies also whether you're selling fiction or non-fiction. Um, I mean, when you sign up with a publisher, as I said, research by the Society of Authors shows that the majority of people are getting advances of around £5,000. I've got a, a client on my books who, um, I could, gosh, I can think of two people who've been paid very small advances and they are very high profile celebrities on the television. Um, and that was for two for a two book deal in one case the other one were um they had photographs that were um nobody else could have got them it was an illustrated book um, and mm. we got one of them a stronger publishing deal the other one we got out of the deal altogether we closed the contract because it was just such a bad contract if yeah. you're being given a thousand pounds or five thousand pounds and you've got a 26 page contract that has things like a compete clause in it that prohibits you producing other um, competitive spin-off products, and you're an entrepreneur, for example, that's yeah. not going to be to your advantage. You're going yeah. to want to have spin-off <laughs> products because that's where the money lies. Um, yeah. Another of the, the uh, clauses increasingly, actually, is that um, they can advertise other authors' books, your competitors often, in the back of your book, and not just 
in the back of your book, but on the back of your book, on your lovely glossy cover, you can have <laughs> adverts for another person's book. Um, that's not going to sit well with most authors. But of course, you can push back on that. And that's yeah. what I'm here for, is to read people's contracts, say what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, and um, as I say, some people are so happy to have a mainstream publishing deal. They're so grateful. They'll do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, that's absolutely fine. You know, that's absolutely fine. And they benefit from that. For example, you know, they might, might not have a big marketing machine behind them and they hope that a publisher will have that. Now, literary agents will, obviously, you know, you can have a, a, a contract with a publisher in this country and then have another 58 contracts with 58 different publishers in 58 different countries. That all adds up to a nice sum of money. You can also get a film deal on your book. And of course, you've got leverage of a whole team working for you if you're with a literary agent. So that can really, really work to your advantage. Now, 10 years ago, um, when people used to buy books from bookshops rather than online from Amazon, yeah. <laughs> um, it really worked to your advantage to have a mainstream publisher um, because you couldn't get into bookstores unless you had a mainstream publisher. Of course, because people are increasingly buying books online and from Amazon, it's broken the back of a lot of publishers. And it means mm. the power right back into the hands of you and I and different people. I was published, my first two books were published by mainstream publishers and I chose self-publishing. And I have to say my clients, the majority of them, like myself, are usually the happiest ones, the ones that win <laughs> the least and are yeah. um, most happy with the process are the self-publishers. They definitely are because they're in control of the whole process. But of course, you know, it's not easy. It's a sharp lear learning curve to learn all the things you need to do to find out about typesetting, about proofreading, mm. about layout, about getting a designer. For some people, that's quite daunting. And then finding out about marketing on top. But if you're going to have to do the marketing and the PR and all the press campaign anyway, why not get all the profits from it? From it, That's what I say. You know, it's just like, why would you give that to the publisher and then only take 10% royalties and let them benefit from your hard work? So it, it varies from person to person, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, but as I say, even if you've got a, a tough publishing contract, you can still push back against it and ask for changes. Yeah, yeah, very good point. And I think, you know, I'm a, an ex-corporate lawyer, so, <laughs> you know, I'm used to seeing things tucked away in contracts. One of the favourite tactics that, uh, you know, the city lawyers would, would do is, send through a contract sort of late on a Friday yeah. so, that you, <laughs> yeah, so that people would have to sort of read it, you know, late into Friday evening when they're, when they're not at their best and, uh, and, uh, it's, uh, and, and things will be sort of tucked away in there. And of course, that's one of the reasons lawyers get paid is to dig that stuff out and, and challenge it. Um, and I take your point that, you know, some people are so grateful they will sign on list anything. But, you know, if you're, you're listening to this and you're thinking about, uh, getting an agent and uh, going down that traditional road, I, I can't advise you strongly enough to at least have somebody who is, you know, skilled in knowing what to look out for, whether that's an agent or a or, or a, a, a literary lawyer. Uh, go through that, and because uh, you you have no idea what is hidden away in there, and uh, you know, one tiny clause could make a huge difference to what you're able to do. And you made a great point that, you know, if, if there's something in there that doesn't allow you to do spin-off products or merchandising and you don't spot that and that's going to be part of your business, then you're in huge trouble. Well, the irony of that, that the, um, the, the compete clause, what's known as the compete clause, is that publishers, unless the book is a phenomenal best-selling success, they don't produce those spin-off products. <laughs> mm, <laughs> so they yeah. stop you doing it. And if you do it, then they'll be in there asking for a percentage. Um, yeah. But they don't do it themselves. So that's one of the infuriating things about it. Um, the other one, of course, to look out for is the severance clause. Um, mm. What happens when there's severance between you? Um, so the, the rights for the book revert back to you. Because obviously, if a book is remaindered when mm. they're put in those bins, or in some cases, they can uh, be, um, I don't even remember, the, the, is it the M6 that's made out of, there's about six, a six mile stretch that's made out of remaindered books from Mills and Booms books. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of motive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. So we've got uh, we've got three parts of the pitch. We've got the, the covering letter, the synopsis, and that first chapter. Um, what else? You, you, you put the pitch together. What's What are the next steps? 
Well, um, you, you, you decide who your agents are that you're going to be targeting. You compile a list of the people that you want to approach. Um, then you send the information to them. Um, as I say, you can wait six months um, to uh, hear back from them. Um, <laughs> it's okay to give them a reminder, say, after six weeks, but don't harass them. Um, yeah. They're phenomenally busy. They'll probably pass on the work to their um, readers. Um, if they're interested, I mean, as I say, usually when I, when I approach them, they come back within a day. They certainly don't come back after a week. Um, and that's because there's something usually compelling enough to make them want to come back. You know, if they're yeah. interested in you, they'll come straight back. They'll be back mm. that afternoon. Um, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, they can wait six months. Um, and just keep going, you know. I mean, the, the etiquette of it is that you're not supposed to pitch. And this is what agents will tell you. We don't want you to pitch anybody else. And they'll say, have you pitched anybody else? And if you have, I'm not interested in your work. Well, if you took, if you waited six months for every agent in the writer's handbook, <laughs> and yeah. there's, what, 200, 300 odd in there, and you waited six months for each of them, <laughs> you might be yeah. very old by the time, you might even not even be around by the time you got yeah. your book published. They're right if you're Yoda. But, uh. <laughs> and then, of course, you've got to wait, you know, 18 months. Even if I got you a publisher tomorrow, you might wait 18 months before your book comes out. Whereas, of course, again, that's another advantage of self-publishing. You can do it, you know, within a week, probably mm. best if you've got everything lined up. Um, so, yes, you can pursue them, but do it um, politely. Not yeah. drunkenly. You'd be amazed how many uh, drunken, <laughs> <laughs> drunken authors there are. If you could listen to my answer machine sometimes in the middle of the night, you'd be amazed. But I have to say, they're usually people who write novels rather than fiction. I've yet to find a drunken fiction, sorry, a non-fiction writer. Yeah. Um, but that's off topic. <laughs> <laughs> Still, interesting point though. And um, what what's the best format? Do you send do you send it physical, sort of old school? by post or do you send the stuff by email? I'm a big fan of sending things um, physical, um, unless it's say to the States, unless it's an agent you're pitching in New York, um, mm -hmm. and then I'll do it with email or if it's someone with whom you've got an established connection. Um, if it's people I know, I work with a lot of agents, so um, I'll send them an email because I know they'll open it. Now, mm -hmm. if it's someone I don't know, are they gonna open my email or are they just probably most likely gonna delete it and put it in their spam? I, th I think people are more likely to take notice of something that arrives in the post, but keep your envelope thin. You don't want one of those yeah. great big doorstep <laughs> things. <laughs> you want yeah. to keep it as thin as possible, as short, again, short and succinct. So I'd say, although it costs more, send a physical, send, don't send your whole manuscript every single time. I think that's a really bad move. You just mm. give them a, a taster and intrigue them and make them want to read on. I mean, when I used to work for the Arts Council, we did, um, I was an assessor for some of their awards and I would get this huge trunk load of manuscripts, massive things, boxes that would arrive at my home to read through. You could tell pretty much, it's like a house, you know, if you're buying a house, you walk in and within three seconds, you know, this is the house for me. It's very rare, mm. you don't. And with manuscripts, again, you know, you can tell pretty much immediately whether somebody's got it and it's going to be a good book. Sometimes you get it wrong, but I'd say, you know, 90% of the times you do know. Um, so just keep it short and sweet and they will, they'll know pretty much straight away. Yeah. Okay. And then something I just wanted to uh, just go back to that you mentioned as important is you, you talked about how, you, you know, you, one of the things you need to convey to the prospective agent is that you understand marketing and media yeah. and, um, and you talked about, you know, your social media platform. Um, have you got any advice for people on, you know, the, are there any particular platforms which which tend to work better or that agents appreciate more? Uh, any particular advice on developing those platforms, which, and, and I'm guessing that's something you probably want to be doing if you haven't got one already to be starting straight away before you get round to the point where your book is written or you're, you're approaching the agents. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, if you go with social media, um, it depends on the actual or who your target audience and readership is. For my book, um, How to Sell a Million Books, what I did, mm. I, I spoke to um, 12 of the world's authors who are all selling over a million books. So they're selling hundreds of millions of books, tens of millions of books. Um, and they all use social media differently. Some use Facebook, mm. some use blogging, some use Twitter. Um, Joanne Harris, for example, author of Chocolat, she uses Twitter a lot. Um, 
Jeffrey Archer, he tends to use his blog and he used to tends to use Facebook. Anne Rice, who wrote The Vampire Chronicles, she tends to use Facebook. Um, now, if you think about your target audience, women often use Pinterest a lot more than men. Um, yeah. If it's a business book, you're more likely to use LinkedIn. Um, mm. Facebook, that's a kind of more general thing, but it's more chatty. It, you can spend a lot of time on it. Um, so it, it varies depending on who your target readership is. If it's a younger audience, it's like to be YouTube because they're more likely to watch short videos. Mm -hmm. Um, or you might choose to use all of them, but I'd say get really good at one of them rather than feeling overwhelmed and daunted by doing all of them. Um, <laughs> and it can really work hugely to your advantage because if you've got a rival author who you admire or who you perhaps don't admire, um, you can actually go and friend their friends in a very subtle, discreet <laughs> way. Um, yeah. And find then you can get, you build a following, but I'd say, with social media, the important thing is not to do it in a kind of random spray gun way. I mean, I've got a client who paid somebody an awful lot of money to build a list for them um, on Twitter. And I think they built something like 100,000 followers, something ridiculous. Um, and they spent a lot of money doing this. Then she sent out this campaign to, in a, a, you know, before her book, um, sold no books. And I was like, well, where are all these people, you know, <laughs> what, where did they get them from? Because they're clearly not your target audience. It's not, that's not yeah. how it works. Um, and obviously you've got to give value. You can't just say, buy from me, buy from me, buy from me. Because people mm. are just not going to be that interested. Um, so yeah, those are some ideas for social media. Um, and generally speaking, I'd say literary agents don't really massively understand social media. They just understand mm. numbers. So if you say to them, I've got 100,000 followers on social media, I've got 10,000 followers. And I think like Hay House will not accept an application from authors now unless they have a um, 5,000 followers on social media. A year ago, it was 3,000. Now it's 5,000. Um, so increasingly, they, they don't necessarily understand how to do it, but they know. <laughs> <laughs> they expect you to understand. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Unless, so, for example, you can say if your book's about golf, there are X many thousand golf people who play golf <coughs> a week. Um, there are X many subscribers to such and such golf magazine. You pick out one figure that gives them an indication of numbers because otherwise they have no idea how many people you can sell your book to. Um, mm. So models work really, really well for you. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a great point. First of all, I want to just pick up on the point of, you know, figure out where your target market is most likely to hang out and that might be the, the platform to, to focus on and then you know start by getting good at one platform and not overwhelming yourself with them all i think that, that those are both key points but i also like the point you just made about you know providing some context you know what the prospective readership is likely to be and it's a bit like you know in in marketing we talk about pricing and people are uh, very bad at knowing what something's worth and so what we tend to always do is you know price relative to something else we sort of we anchor to something that we're familiar with and, and then kind of guess from there and so it, it makes perfect sense that you know you want to give an anchor to your prospective uh, agent stroke publisher uh, that that is going to work in your favor rather than just leaving it to them because they might come up with a figure that's completely different and i decided to to not to take you on on that basis. So I think that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and often they'll also ask you to do the, the background for them. Um, and I th one of the things I do when I'm working with clients is I ask them to do a very detailed reader profile sheet. So they've got a real thorough understanding of who their target reader is. Because often mm. what I find is people will write a book and they'll think, well, damn, who am I going to sell it to? And they do it after <laughs> they've written the book, which seems crazy yeah. to me. Or we really yeah. should be writing your marketing <laughs> right before you write your book I mean it's just yeah. like thinking, you're launching what effectively is a product onto the market we, we're back to that common sense thing aren't we <laughs> <laughs> you won't launch a new you know a new anything a new product food or anything without testing it first but this is what people do with books they think that somehow with a book because you can write well you can just write any old thing and somehow people will find the way to your book it just doesn't work like that mm. you need your marketing plan first and have a thorough understanding of who you're going to sell your book to and how 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 are you going to do it um yeah so and it does work very very well as i say yeah and with that um with that 
reader profile sheet you just mentioned. Is that something, I mean, obviously that's very useful for you as, as the author because you can get clear on what you need to be writing about, if, particularly if you're sort of solving problems, what, are the, what is that audience's problem or problems? Uh, is that something that is worth including in your, your pitch to, as a way of sort of demonstrating to the, uh, the agent that you've actually really sort of thought things through and, and kind of dug into the whole subject? No. <laughs> no. Okay. No so, so it really is. No, it's, that, it's, that's the bit of the iceberg that stays hidden. <laughs> okay. Short and sweet all the way with agents. Absolutely everything is short and sweet. If there's something particularly relevant that's in that um, the a reader profile sheet, then yes, include it. But no, that's really for you to get really clear about who you're pitching your book to um and your marketing plan sometimes agents will ask you for a marketing plan a very detailed marketing plan because mm. really they're trying to get you to do the work for them yeah. and <laughs> save on their resources and their funding um so that really usually flummox or flummoxes authors um because yeah. then you're looking at other authors that you're competing with you and what they're selling their books for mm. So it might be, would it be something then, you know, again, obviously with the, the profile sheet and the marketing plan, obviously they, they're sort of related in a sense, to just mention them and say that you that like to see them without actually bombarding them with that additional, that those additional sheets. I would say not. Um, no, okay. I would say um, unless it's, say, a publisher like Wiley, a business publisher, and that's their language and they understand that on the whole um agents um they understand how to sell books and they get they've got a really strong feel for something that's marketable and something mm. that's compelling you know something they feel excited about and enthusiastic about i mean it's just an it's an emotion and again that's something that authors forget it's it's not a logical yeah. academic jog anything it's about that kind of feeling of excitement and emotion and enthusiasm about a book and if you're feeling passionate while you're writing that kind of the, the emotion shimmers through your letter, through your pitch, through your book, um, and that's transferable yeah. without overhyping yourself, of course, because again, that's a bit of a turn off. So it's striking mm. that delicate balance between the two um, and transferring your emotion really over to the agent so that they feel excited about the book too. Okay, and then I, another critical question is in terms of timing uh, that the pitch as, as one stage of the process and writing the book uh, as another stage. Uh, should you be pitching first, you know, getting clear on what you want to write about, but then creating the pitch and sending that off before you write the book uh, rather than, you know, risk writing a book and then having nobody pick it up or given that we can now self publish so easily, it's okay to go ahead and write the book and, and do the pitch afterwards. What's your advice for people there? You can do either. I mean, this is one of the interesting things that comes down to author psychology because I've pitched ideas for um, books um, and some of them they'll want to see just, in fact, I'm just about to pitch one for somebody who's written a book about um, Asian mother-in-laws and dealing with Asian mother-in-laws. Fantastic topic, um, brilliant book, beautifully written. Um, well, I say brilliantly written, the first few chapters are brilliantly written and I'm confident that I'll be able to get a deal on that book. Um, Often it's the idea and authors, I mean, whether I'd be able to get more money if it was finished rather than now, I think probably if the book was finished, she would get more money for it. So it can work, it can work two ways. One is with an unfinished book. Um, people don't always have a strong idea of, of the quality of the writing or how strong it is as a book. Um, but for some people, they need the incentive because they need the deadline to, and the impetus <laughs> to get them finished. Um, yeah. With others, they find it crippling if they have a deadline. Suddenly, they get writer's block and they can't write. Amazingly, um, yeah. So I suppose it it depends on how people work. Um, with some so people that's... get knockbacks and rejections, then they think, oh, it's a no go or it's not worth going. Mm. Um, it's not worth going with it. So I don't know. It's it's very. I, I'm kind of the jury's out on that one, really. Yeah. So it sounds like that's more really to do with you as the author and knowing your own psychology rather than whether it has a big impact on yeah. um, whether you know the end result in terms of agents and publishers. And um, you know, in, in the time we got, I just want to touch also on advances as well because one of the things I've I've been hearing is that advances are gradually coming down, and publishers and of course agents in turn are becoming more risk averse. It's one of the reasons why that platform is so important. You talked about how 
um, I think it was, was it Hay House, they, they've gone from 3,000 to 5,000 social media followers in the last uh, year. So, you know, is, is that a trend? Is, is that, first of all, is that the case? And, and so if it is, is that a trend that you see continuing? Well, I mean, you do have surprises. There are surprises. For example, um, the year before last, um, one of the one of the people I'd worked with came to me with a novel she'd written in verse, um, and she'd been paid nearly six figures a uh, six figure advance for that. Now I could have fallen over. <laughs> you know, I was just like, whoa! I don't, you know, I didn't think, you know, a novel in verse. What are you on about? Um, I would not have thought in a million years that that book would have got. Um, oh. I even found a publisher to be absent to be absolutely truthful with you. <laughs> what? And you know, nearly six figures? Are you kidding me? Um, yeah. So there are still exceptions, um, mm. but they like it's it's similar to films in a way. They want a tried and tested, blah, spit it out, tested formula. They want something that's uh, that, that has been proven to work. And yes, they are becoming increasingly risk averse. Um, so they want to know. If it's a business book, for example, with Wiley, they want to know that you're a speaker, that you're speaking at big events, that you're going mm. to push the book to your list, and they ask for a very detailed marketing plan. Um, so that's for business books. Um, with uh, fiction, they want to have a really compelling story, and again, a genre book that's for a specific genre and slightly different than other genre books, a different spin on it. Um, but that's why, for example, something like, like Mills and Boone, you know, whether you read Mills and Boone or not, I'm, I have to say I'm not a big reader, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I was talking at a conference the other weekend with someone who's written 60 Mills and Boone, Boone's books. Now, are there many variations on the way that you can write a standard romance of two people hating each other and then falling in love? No, <laughs> they can be in a hospital, they can be in a car park, they can be car park attendants. There's, there's a limit, isn't there? You know, yeah. there's ways you can write it, but it's a formula. And people keep buying it. Very it's successful, yeah. Very successfully. And people keep writing those same old books. So uh, although it's not always what authors want to hear, um, yes, they are going for tried and tested formulas um, over, and, over and over again. And they're not taking that many risks. Um, and in the past, of course, publishers largely act, acted as benefactors for authors. Mm. You know, there were a few at the top maybe 10% who are earning large sums of money and they were subsidizing the other people who were not making so much money. And there's a lot of kudos in say somebody winning a Booker Prize or winning um, what, what, the Orange Prize or one of the other mm. prizes for Whitbread. Um, but, and publishers valued that, but I'd say increasingly it's becoming money driven because they are struggling, bookshops are closing, yeah. and publishers are struggling too. Yeah. But it's important to know those things. It's important to be aware of those trends because um, and how you fit into that as an author, I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, often you can do both. There's a, there's a lot to be said, for example, being published by a mainstream publisher and then self-publishing. So you, you've got your foot in both camps. You've got the, some people feel like they're not, they still feel as though self-publishing is vanity publishing until they've got that nice little logo, penguin logo on the spine. They don't feel like they're, they're a proper author somehow. But, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways it's good to do both. Mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, you, you've got some great stuff that we've, you've talked about. Is there anything else before we start to wrap things up that you we haven't had a chance to talk about that you think is worth mentioning that people should know if they're going to go down the road of, of getting an agent? I say, you've great stuff already, but uh, anything we've missed? I'd say the title. We haven't actually covered the title. Oh. Book, yeah, that's kind of crucial. <laughs> crucial in um, getting your book noticed. I mean, obviously, it can be changed. Agents can change it, but if you want them to to, to take notice of your book and your readers to take notice of the book, the title. I mean, um, there was a, a bookseller in the 1930s, Emmanuel Holderman Julius, who wrote the Little Blue Book series. Mm. Um, and if anyone goes and researches it, you'll see that he he did research on the difference that a book title. Make. Yeah, there's huge difference. Um, Can I give you an example? Because I actually was looking at um, he he's he's actually written a paper or he wrote a paper, oh, yeah. and uh, I pulled out some examples for a for a previous um, presentation. And there's one where it, and the, these are annual sales. If if uh, yeah. if you didn't see this on the other presentation, one is called originally it was the fleece of gold it sold six thousand copies he changed the name to the quest for the blonde mistress and the following year it sold fifty thousand copies so yeah. more than eight times as many copies i'll give you another example um the uh, here, okay here we go pen pencil and poison was the original title five thousand copies so not 
not too shabby, even if it's a five cent or a 10 cent book, changed that to the story of a notorious criminal and it jumped to 15,800 copies. So again, it more than tripled. And there's just two examples. There are, he's, I mean, it's a great paper to, to read and uh, you, can, you can get it online. And uh, there are dozens of examples in there. So, sorry, I thought I'd just share that since yeah, I had scribbled them down absolutely. the other day. <laughs> and subtitle, absolutely, really important. And the same amount of attention should be paid to your chapter headings. Yeah, and have you got any um, any sort of pointers? I know, obviously, the titles are going to vary dramatically depending on whether it's fiction, non-fiction, what, what genre or what niche you're writing in, but any sort of you know, kind of universal pointers to getting a good title? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> or is that a whole nother presentation? <laughs> oh gosh, I mean, with, it's easier with a non-fiction book because you're thinking about the benefits for the reader. I'd say avoid kind of jargon or academic speak. Um, think how the reader's thinking, think of their, you know, their problem or their challenge and how they think when they come to you um, and the sort of things that you hear people say um, and often a lot of the books with the titles that tap into that work. But then also you get the intriguing titles. I mean, I had an author I was working with called Annie Katzina, and she came to me with a book um, called Conversations with Cupid. Now, she's a relationship coach. And mm. um, while we were working together, I said to her, oh, you know, why, wh why is it that you're writing this book about relationships? And she said, I realized I'd chosen my dog more carefully than my husband. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so she's titled the book now, how, how to choose your dog. No, no. Do you choose your dog more carefully than your husband? And of course yeah. it's fun. It's getting a serious message across yeah. in a fun way about, you know, she's come up with all sorts of funny facts. Well, funny, sort of sad, funny, darkly humorous, shall we say, um, such as the average Labrador lives for longer than the average ma uh, marriage lasts. Um, very, very funny stories about <laughs> what her dog did, her husband saying to her, you know, it's the dog or me, darling. And she said, I'll, I'll choose the dog. Um, you know, there were, <laughs> it's a really funny book, but it's full of really valuable tidbits. But because of that, she got a lot of media coverage. She got yeah. um, interviewed by Anne Diamond. Um, she got radio coverage. She was in the Daily Mail online. Um, she had a radio, a TV station rather in Australia phoning her wanting interviews. She was offered an interview on This Morning um, television. And because it's media friendly and it's fun, um, so mm. it can make all the difference. So you can go for the fun side of things or you can go for the, you know, in a way, the readers, the things that your readers are thinking about and they want solutions to. So that can work really, really well. Good. I like that. That's uh, <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Um, Okay, so well, I think you know, we probably need to, to wrap things up now. I think we'll be going about an hour. So, um, Stephanie, thanks so much for everything you've given us so far. Where do people go if they want to find out more about you and follow up with you, perhaps uh, engage in your services and so on? Well, um, if they want to come to OxfordWriters.com, that's the Oxford Literary, we we ugh, spit out, Oxford Literary Consultancy website. <laughs> I'll have to choose a business name in future that I can speak and say without stumbling. Um, there's also the RichWriterPoorWriter.com newsletter. So that's RichWriterPoorWriter um, newsletter. And that's a weekly newsletter that gives you marketing tips, book marketing tips and information about publishing. Um, but if you want to, um, for example, have proofreading, editing, help with your pitch to literary agents, um, understand how to hook to agents, or you want me to look over your book contract, anything like that, it's just oxfordwriters.com at the Oxford Literary Consultancy. Fantastic. So, Stephanie, big thank you for being part of the Self-Publishing Summit. It's been really fascinating getting your insights into this. And as I say, nobody else has covered this particular topic before, so it's it's great. And uh, so thanks for your expertise and thanks for being a guest on the summit. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Stephanie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.